record. Okay, so, so that's the important word, growth strata, because they record uh, the, the, active, uh, the, the tectonic activity of the basin in which the strata were deformed, were deposited. And so uh, because we, have, we are a li little bit limited in time, um, I propose to, to show you two examples uh, of growth strata in foreland and in an extensional basin. So in a compressive and in a, and in a, um, and in a, an extent an extensional uh, basin. So I will take example uh, in the Pyrenees and the image you have in the back here is uh, is that of the Pyrenees. It's uh, it's the Ainsa. Uh, this is the Ainsa Lake, and you see a small church here, uh, which is just out of the water because this is an artificial dam that you can see here. And uh, so they had to inundate uh, a village. And there is a big uh, anticline. Uh, here you see the west flank of an anticline. And all of the basin field that is above here, above the anticline, is all syntectonic. It's deposited uh, with the tectonic activity. So that's what we will uh, talk about today. And clearly, it's a it's a small part of the domain, but at least I want you to have kind of a, something, some examples, some images uh, when you hear interactions between tectonic and sedimentation or when you hear growth strata. I really want you to have a few ideas and images in your mind when, when people talk about this. So uh, the first part uh, on fallen settings is uh, is related to um, to a paper uh, uh, and to a, a series of studies I did on on the um, re reliability of uh, using growth strata to to interpret the kinematics uh, of uh, growth structures. Growth structures are folds and faults. Uh, of uh, kilometric, multi-kilometric scale uh, developed in uh, a sedimentary uh, basin. And so how you can use the strata to reconstruct the tectonic activity of such folds and folds. And so here in the back, I just show another field picture um, where you see, you see this, this big, um, these, these faces here, they are actually strata dipping towards the left, and they are the west flank of a, of a big anticline that goes behind. So it's, it's an anticline like this, if you see what I mean. And here there is erosion in these valleys and sedimentation in the front, okay? So typically, these, the strata here are going to be deformed as this structure is growing, okay? How can we use the strata to understand the, the tectonic development of the, the fold uh, next to it. So I will start with some very, you recognize this picture with some very basics about understanding the stratigraphic record. And I'll show you the example of the growth of the Pico del Aguila anticline. It's an anticline um, in the South Pyrenees which I actually studied for my master uh, back a long time ago. And we'll talk about sedimentology and sequence stratigraphy and how, how the, the, the growth of the anticline, you see it's uplift with time, is recorded with time. And uh, an important aspect of high frequency growth strata and growth structure kinematics. In particular, we have little sequences you remember these triangles, you have your, your, your little uh, sequence strat um, slide in the, in the source to sink course. Uh, those sequences, are they due to tectonics or are they due to climate? And how do they record tectonic? Are they, are they influenced by tectonics? So very large, uh, introduction here is uh, about the sedimentary record. Um, uh, we talked a lot about it in the, in the source to sink uh, course, but also you, you, 
you know what the sedimentary record here but is, but I always want to emphasize um, how we address the sedimentary record and why we, why we look at it. And um, it's, it's better to do that on the field, but you can do that on the field anywhere. Uh, this is just one picture, which I think is interesting because it shows different scales. Um, and this is in Baisun. Uh, you can look where it is uh, on Google Earth, but that's in, uh, in Uzbekistan in, a, in quite a remote place, a really beautiful place. And uh, here in the background, you see this, this big, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a little, uh, there is a, a cliff, it's a little mountain, it's a big cliff, but a little mountain. And you, you can see sedimentary strata here. You have the base of the strata here, maybe uh, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, you don't see a cliff here. So probably it's, uh, it's soft material. Then you have a nice cliff, then it's a very, uh, it's more dark material here and uh, vegetation. And then there is a big carbonate cliff. So this is a whole uh, middle Jurassic uh, section. And you start from uh, actually uh, clastic, uh, parallelic, uh, shallow marine and lacustrine systems going into swamps and continental environments in the, in the, in the Jurassic. And you have here a big carbonate platform with reefs. Um, and so basically we see a big change in depositional environment with time. And one of the question is why do we see changing sedimentation? Uh, why is it tectonics that, that change the system? Is it climate? Uh, but that just illustrates uh, a, a very big perturbation of the, of, the, of the local environment because you don't sediment at all the same rocks with time. And why do we observe such a, such a change in the positional environment? Uh, it's the signature of what processes. And you see also in the foreground here, you see in the foreground, many little strata like this, like this, like this, like this here. And these strata are separated by reddish, more soft material. So this is a fluvial uh, sequence. You see that it's dipping towards the left whereas this is more probably dipping into the picture uh, and almost maybe, I mean, it looks horizontal here, but it's actually dipping into the picture. And so these, these strata here, they also record changes of depositional environment, but at a much higher frequency. Here it's over several million years that we see a change from clastic to carbonate. And here we see an alternation between something resistant, probably sandy, and something more soft, um, probably more shaly, clay, silty, and reddish. And so these are fluvial system, and it's it, this, this alternation here just records the, the going and and uh, and uh, leaving of the of of uh, fluvial channels. But is this the record of changes in climate as well at a much higher frequency? So, as you know, there are uh, uh, so all of this shows that we have stratigraphic changes, stratigraphic cycles. Often these, ch these, these changes are repetitive. That's why we speak about cycles. Um, and we think that these cycles and these changes, they, they reflect movements and changes of the whole sedimentary landscape, okay? And sequence stratigraphy tells us that because of sea level changes, for instance, in this picture, I have sea level falling and then rising. When it's falling, my, my, uh, my shoreline goes seaward. And then when it's rising, my shoreline goes landward. So sequence stratigraphy tells us that changes of, deposit of um, some factors govern the changes and the, the movements of my depositional environment of my sedimentary landscape. So my whole landscape is moving seaward and then moving landward and then again seaward, etc., etc. Such that on one section, one vertical section, I see marine and then shoreline and then, and then fluvial and then marine again. And the three main controlling factors are sediment input which is itself controlled by upstream tectonics and climate, basement tectonics, 
and climatic, I call it climatic base level. So it's eustasy, it's the lake, uh, all of these factors changing this level here. Okay. And last week, uh, we said, okay, based on that, you know, sequence stratigraphy has this constant, subsidence constant, and everything is governed by changing of this uh, parameter. So this line governs the, the going and, and leaving of the, 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 the landward and seaward motions of the shoreline. And we said, okay, there is also sediment input. And above sediment input, there is a whole sediment routing system influenced itself by tectonics and climate. And so we need to study the whole system. But I also told you when I introduced sedimentary basins that there is tectonics here inside the basin. And so the, the domain of the interactions between tectonics and sedimentation, the domain of, of growth strata really is related to that is related to how local tectonics in the basin are going to change this record of uh, the movement of the whole sedimentary landscape. So we speak about syntectonic sedimentation. Syntectonic sedimentation means that you have sedimentation at the same time as tectonic is taking place, okay? So here I show you a picture that I took uh, in the Zagros Fold and Trust Belt in Iran in 2006. And um, there is here, what you see here, what you should see here is that, so always your eye, when you look at outcrop, should be looking for changes in the sedimentation type and strata. And there, the relationships between strata and the lateral and vertical evolution of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of the facies and the geometry. Tu l'as trouvé où? C'est pas vrai. Sérieux, tu peux m'amener le, le, le reste? Um, so here, when, I'm, when I see such a, such a, super, merci beaucoup. When I see such a, um, such um, a, such an outcrop, such a view, I see the strata here. Here I see uh, just debris, but here I, I can see the, strat the, the stratification, and I can see that it's probably more shaly and uh, less resistant. And then I see the strata here, and what I clearly see is that the strata here they dip. They are more steeply. They are steep. They are steeper than here. Do you see that? Yes. This is dipping maybe forty-five degrees, and this is dipping maybe forty, thirty-five degrees. It's a slight difference, but it's a difference. And I look here in the back. This looks maybe horizontal, but be careful. Here it looks horizontal, and it is the same strata as here. So it depends on the perspective and on the angle. Uh, and, and on the outcrop orientation. Huh? But also here in the back, I see horizontal strata. You know, they are in the same outcrop orientation as this almost, and they, they look horizontal. And so basically what I see is a change from uh, steeply dipping to almost horizontal, okay? What I also see is that my steeply dipping strata here, they, they kind of, they come and they pinch here into these ones. So if I prolongate this and I follow this very closely, I see here a relationship where this one is actually pinching onto this one. And this one is actually coming here and there is a top lap here. Okay, these strata, they come directly into contact with this. Do you see that these strata here, they come directly into contact with that? Yes. Okay, whereas here, they are here, and these strata here, they are here. So here there is a lot of thickness between them, and here there is zero thickness, which means there is a nonconformity. Okay, there is an angular unconformity between, between those below and those above. Okay, 
So this is super important because this shows that there is an unconformity here. And to make an unconformity, you need tectonics almost always. Okay. Um, also, what we will be mentioning is that this unconformity is actually, seems to be actually be progressive. Progressive unconformity means the angle, the, the, the deep of the strata is changing progressively. Okay. From something steep here to something horizontal there in the background. So it's a progressive unconformity. Um, okay, so that's very important. That's syn tectonic sedimentation. You can also say syn sedimentary tectonic. And so I show you two examples here how this may form in a growth detachment fold and in a growth normal fold. Don't mistake fold and fold, okay? Ça, c'est les plis et ça, c'est les failles. Okay, fold and fold. And the growth fold is a fold that develops uh, in a context of active sedimentation. A growth fold is a fold that develops in a context, context of active sedimentation. So here, I, what you see, a detachment fold is when you have, um, uh, you know, there is compression. There is these two little arrows here. And you have to imagine you can take um, uh, if I um, if I just do that uh, I just need to okay just stop sharing show my uh, my table so if you take simply uh, a, a folder a, uh, imagine this is a, a level a sedimentary uh, layer when you when you do a, a detachment fold you just do that okay and why is it a detachment fold it's because between my red layer and the top of my table there is a detachment level it means there is a surface that allows the red layer to be detached from the table there is a there is a weakness okay if if they were uh, together, I couldn't fold. If, if I put glue, okay, below my, uh, my red uh, towel here, napkin, if I, put, if I glue it to the table, I won't be able to, to fold. So it shouldn't be glued. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be uh, together with it. It should be detached. Often a detachment, the detachment layer is often salt uh, or something very uh, argillaceous, very clay. It's a weak, uh, it's a weak layer in the sediment. And an important thing is that the detachment fold, you know, grows fast at the beginning, but as you see at the end, you know, I cannot grow anymore. When I'm here, I'm stuck, and there is a moment where I can push as much as I want. You know, it's not going to grow more. So the growth curve of such a fold is, is, a, is a, it grows fast at the beginning and then it, it becomes zero. Okay. So that's what I show. Uh, this is what I show here on the, on the screen. Um, do you see my screen now, my uh, uh, full screen? No, we can. Ah, okay. Okay. So here you see the growth. Uh, so the growth, the pre-growth strata is the red layer. And here I just started to fold. And to do the folding, I don't do something smooth, but I fix the hinge, la charnière. I fix the hinge here, one hinge here, one hinge here, and one hinge here. And I sediment at the same time, because I imagine that this fold is maybe underwater. And so I put sediment at the same time as I do my folding. Because I have a fold, I have a little bit of local uplift here, and I can put more sediment here in the sink line, a little less 
on the head of the anticline and a bit more in the other syncline. Okay, so I have a thickness evolution from thick here to thin here. And now I continue folding. You see that now I just folded the dark gray layer and I put again sediment. Again, I can put more in the syncline and less on the anticline and more in the syncline. And now I will fold again. You see that I just developed here a progressive unconformity. Why? Because the white layer started to be deformed early. So it has seen a lot of deformation. Therefore, it's, it's steep, steeply dipping. The gray layer was deposited after the white. So it has seen less deformation. Therefore, the final dip is less. The light gray has even less dip. And the last layer is horizontal. So I have a progressive angular unconformity, which is a record of the growth of this fold structure. Is that OK on the principle? Yes. Yes. OK. Now, the same thing is valid for a fault, a normal fault, for instance. It could be a reverse fault. A reverse fault will do something more like this. But a normal fault has the same behavior. So look at this. You start with a, with a strata and you break the strata. There is faulting and you deposit in the hanging wall. You know the word hanging wall and foot wall. This is the hanging wall. C'est le, le toit. And this is the foot wall, le mur de la faille in French. So in the hanging wall, because it's, a, it's like you can imagine you're sliding on a slope, you're hanging to try not to slide. Uh, this is what happens to this to this uh, to this um, compartment. Okay, it's kind of hanging and tries not to slide, but it's it's sliding. And so here you create a, a hole. Therefore, you can put more sediment, and you have less on the foot wall. And when you continue like this, you progressively have, you know, a progressive and conformity, a fan-shaped uh, record here with less and less steep strata as you go upward uh, towards younger strata towards the top. OK, an example of this uh, is here um, on the field. Just let, let me just one second. I will just um, uh, stop. The... OK, uh, thank you. I am here. Uh, okay, so what you are you here? Yes. Uh, what you see here is an example of uh, very, I think, very similar to to this situation. There is a fault, and there is a hanging wall with more sediment than in the foot wall. It's a small scale example. You see, it's also, you know, the term listric. A listric fault is a normal fault. Uh, maybe, I don't know if it exists also for reverse, but it's a fault that is steeper in its upper part and as, uh, as is, is steeping less in the down part. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit like concave. And so you clearly see that. I think we clearly see that this um, this uh, this thickness here probably corresponds. You know, this probably corresponds to this. You see, it's thickly bedded. Uh, it has a bit the same characteristics, and this is more thin bedded. It looks more like that, but here it's thinner than here. Here is much thicker. So the idea here, when you see such an outcrop and you think that this is time equivalent to that. And this is time equivalent to this, because here above it looks like it's going through. Okay, so this above, even though we see something here like a fault, it looks like this above has not been affected by the faulting, whereas this has clearly been affected by the faulting. So this looks like syntectonic, and this here looks like post tectonic. 
hasn't been affected. So there is the pre-tectonic, the syntectonic, and the post-tectonic, or pre-growth, syn-growth, and post-growth. And these are the growth strata, they are here. Okay, and this is a little bit more steeply dipping than that. Uh, okay, to the Pico del Arguila anticline. Um, what you see is a shuttle, um, uh, is an image uh, from the shuttle um, of the Pyrenees. And in fact, we see the Atlantic, uh, it's a little bit ups, uh, upside down, but the north is here and the south is here with France, Spain, the Mediterranean here and the Atlantic here, the Basque country is, uh, is here. Um, and the Pyrenees are this little, very little mountain range. Um, and they have a very special structure. Um, the upper plate is the Iberian plate. The lower plate is the Eurasian plate. And this is the Aquitaine basin. This is the Ebro basin. It's a fallen basin like this one, but this is the pro foreland, if you remember our lecture, and this is the retro foreland. And in the pro foreland, we clearly see a lot of deformation here. Uh, okay, you see all of this relief also here. These are fold and trust. So this is a fold and trust belt. In a centure, the pli et chevauchement, or pli et faille. Uh, so it's a it's a, um, it's deformation in the orogenic wedge propagating into the fallen basin. Okay, we don't have that on that side. On this side, it looks like it's very sharp the boundary between the mountain range and the basin, and there is not much deformation in the basin. It's actually buried and not much deformed. This is because there is a much more steeply dipping fault here that marks the boundary between the mountain range and the basin. And that's more typical of the of the retro foreland basin. And it's typical of the pro foreland to have this fold and truss belt. You see that also in the Zagros, you see that in the Apennines, you see that in the Alps. Uh, the pro foreland often has this very uh, very well expressed uh, fold and truss belt in the front in the in the in the in the orogenic wedge. And I've been studying uh, folds, uh, folds with a D, that are situated here. Uh, there is a, a series of folds here at the, at the edge of the trust of the fold and trust belt. That's the orogenic front. Um, uh, there is a series of folds that I've been uh, studying, uh, and one in particular actually. And many people in the Pyrenees. Uh, Many people from uh, from from Spain and and uh, from Catalonia, but also from Britain, uh, America, uh, France, have been working in this fold and trust belt because it's very nicely exposed, and the sediments actually that have been deposited during the activity of the trust and the folds are a great opportunity to to investigate the dynamics of the growth of these of these structures. So it is a little bit of a, of a more regional geology uh, for you about the Pyrenees. And now we have the north to the north and we recognize the Aquitaine Basin with Toulouse. Uh, this is the Béarn with Po uh, here. Um, and here you see the Ebro Basin. Uh, Barcelona is somewhere here and Pamplona is here and the Basque country uh, is here. And the Pyrenees have this uh, simple uh, classical structure with an axial zone, zone axial, with basement rocks, which are of the Ercinian classical, Ercinian and pre ercinian uh, basement, granites, gneisses, uh, Paleozoic sediments. There is a Mesozoic cover, like in the Alps, with Jurassic, Cretaceous, and uh, well, with uh, Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. So pink, blue, and uh, green that you also find here. Pink for the Triassic, blue for the Jurassic, and green for the Cretaceous, and also this one. And then there is the Cenozoic, the tertiary, okay? 
The tertiary are more the ochre, uh, the yellows and the oranges uh, colors. And this is both basins. And you see that the tertiary colors are in both basins. So this, just by seeing the map here, you can say that the Ebro Basin and the Aquitaine Basin, they developed in the Cenozoic, mostly. If you look in detail, they started to develop at, at the end of the Cretaceous in the C2 and into the Paleocene in the E1 and, uh, and after, okay? And you can also see when it was mostly finished. It was mostly finished sometime in the Miocene because the M, the Miocene, uh, is actually not affected by the trust. You see the trust, they are below in dashed uh, lines and the Miocene is not very deformed. It doesn't show uh, folds and folds, okay? Same thing for here. The Miocene is, is very little affected by faulting and folding, okay? So basically just by reading the map, you can see when the basin started and when it, uh, it was finished. And the folding and the trust, fold and trust belt, you see very well here. It's all this area going from here to here with trusts, these uh, dark black lines with little triangles showing that this compartment went above this one. Um, and folds, you recognize folds with a color in the middle and the same color on the other sides, okay? So this, for instance, G in the middle, E on the side, this is a big sink line with an axis like that. You see many folds uh, here, like the C in the middle and the, the green on both sides here. You see that here, you see that everywhere. You have folds and trust everywhere, which you don't have much here. Actually, you still have a little bit of that in this area, but it's all covered otherwise. So here is your fold and trust belt. And the ones we are going to talk about are little folds that are exactly here. Um, and as you can see from this map, it looks like we see folds already. So their, their attitude in the map is already like folds. It means that these are probably folds that have been tilted. And now, uh, because of the erosive uh, erosion surface, we see them in map view. It's like if we see them in a, in a section. So here is the uh, Argis Pico del Aguila anticline, and that's the, the, the study area. Um, so here I just wanted to show that uh, this, this landscape is, uh, is, uh, is quite amazing. And you have the Sierra de Guara here, uh, which is the edge of the, the Pyrenees. Uh, so it's the, the front of the Pyrenees. It's pretty dramatic uh, relief, uh, really beautiful. Um, and the fold I've studied is, uh, is right there at the front of this, uh, of this Sierra. So it's here at the front. And this is a zoom uh, simplified geological map. You see that what I was saying before, there is the trust here, which is the frontal trust of the Pyrenees. And if you look at the geology here, you see this dark layer here are Triassic to Cretaceous rocks. Here, this is mostly early Paleocene and early Eocene rocks. And here you see Eocene, Middle Eocene and Upper Eocene. And so just if you just look into the box, it looks like a fold seen from the side. And indeed, you see the dipping, the deep signs here. Uh, the rocks are dipping to the west, here to the east, and here to the north. It's really a fold that has been tilted to the north and eroded, such that now you see from the air, from the from the from up from up from an up an upstream an, an upward uh, perspective, you see a fold in map view. And so 
the the inside here is made of this uh, Triassic to Cretaceous rocks. It's there is all this Triassic salt that plays the role of the detachment level, and the rest is this is the pre-tectonic layer. And here in the Eocene, upper, middle to upper Eocene, you have the syntectonic layer. You see that because you can see in map view already that it's much thicker in the syncline than on the anticline. And again, much thicker here. And actually, there's another fold here, another fold here, another fold here. So there is a series, a succession of folds, and they are all syntectonic. And then this is all post-tectonic. Just, monsieur. Ouais. Juste pour bien comprendre, euh, les plis qu'on voit là, c'est des plis qui ont été couchés vers le nord. Exact. Qui ont été, ok, et ensuite ils ont été érodés. Ensuite, il y a l'érosion. Ils ne sont pas complètement érodés, mais l'érosion fait que maintenant on les voit comme si on les voyait en coupe. Ah, ok, d'accord, super. Voilà. C'est l'aspect la, cartographique d'aujourd'hui. C'est comme un aspect en coupe euh, à l'époque où ils ont été faits. Mmh. Okay. Justement parce qu'ils ont été. Euh, ils, pour faire une coupe, normalement, il faudrait faire une sorte de tranchée et regarder du côté si, la, si le pli n'était pas penché. Mais si le pli hop, est, est basculé vers le nord, bah, tout d'un coup, tu, vois ça, tu le vois en coupe. Oui, exact. Merci. So, Juste une here... question par rapport à, à la, la slide d'avant. Oui, je ne t'entends pas très bien par contre, Claire. Euh... Est-ce que vous m'entendez mieux comme ça Oui, là c'est mieux. Ok, c'est le masque. Euh, bah, le, le, la couche post-tectonique, c'est celle qui est grise foncée, et les pré-tectoniques, c'est l'autre gris foncé et, et la couche de calcaire. Alors, ça, là, tout ça, ça c'est pré-tectonique. Attendez, ouais. j'ai une question. Est-ce que c'est Et c'est où Ah, c'est ça. On regarde. C'est pas du tout. La petite astre, la petite. C'est ça, c'est le russe. Ouais, ça que. Et. Comment je fais pour y aller? Ah, oui, ben en fait, pour y aller, identificator ou just me. Je vais sur Zoom, je dis. Euh... Tu vas rentrer ça. Oui. Et après, je pense que tu n'as pas besoin de mettre un mot de. Ah, ou alors, ou alors c'est ça. Le non, passe, ouais. parole, c'est ça. Oui. OK. Um, Excuse-moi. Ah oui, alors, alors si tu veux ça, c'est la, la couche de détachement. This is the pre the, the detachment level. So, of course, this is pre-tectonic. Then this is pre-tectonic as well. It's a carbonate layer. And then there is the light gray and this dark gray. These are syntectonic. And this one last here, the white with little dots, this is post-tectonic. OK Ça va clair pour toi, ça Oui, c'est parfait. parfait. OK. So here we see the same, but uh, in a cross-section, reconstructed cross-section. So here, here it's really like if you see a cross-section. Um, it's just a cross-section that, that goes from east to west. So it's cross-section that goes from here to here. And all of these faults, we can reconstruct them and they look like this. So you see this is a a series of folds, and they are all like the one I was making with my little napkin. The first one here is kind of a strange structure, kind of a double anticline. Uh, this is the Gabardier La Luzera anticline. Then there is the Belsue syncline. We give the name of the local little village. This is the Pico del Aguila anticline. It's the nicest one I find. And then here is the Bentue de Rassal, and here the Rassal. And in fact, there is the progradation here of, of a delta X system. And, and this fold is nice to study because we can nicely see the progradation here and the progradation here and the progradation here, which is not the case to, of this one because we only have progradation here and not here. 
uh, the delta x system and here is also too distal okay it's too in the in the more uh, open marine environment and so we have less facious variations so we don't see uh, things very well so this is the local structure and to finish introducing uh, this but, uh, this is a, a, a larger scale cross section um, of of that that will go from from here to here of this big syncline here which is actually a basin when you see um when you see a, a synclinal structure at this scale, you see the scale here is about, uh, there is no scale on the picture, but this is about probably 50 kilometers. Okay, from here to here. So it's a big, big syncline with G oligocene in the middle, uh, E2 on both sides, uh, so it's a big syncline. Actually, E2 is much thicker here than here. You see that E2 is this orange and this orange with, with, that, with little dots. So E2 on this side of the syncline is much thicker than E2 on this side of the syncline. Okay. And here you see some Cretaceous and here you see some Cretaceous. So you have a huge syncline, but very asymmetric. And this huge syncline, very asymmetric, is actually what we call a piggyback basin, maybe you heard the, tame, the, the name, it's a little basin that is transported on this trust. Okay, so this is the section you can see here. This is north northeast and this is south. You see the trust is at the base and you see this big sink line and the little E2 is this and the thick E2 is this outcropping okay we have a lot of upper eocene on that side and much less on this side okay so here we have syntectonic uh, interactions and syntectonic features at the scale at, of kilometric folds and faults and also at the scale of uh, of intra basin folds and uh, in, intra basin basins like piggyback basins Okay, right at the trust front, you have much more deformation here and there. There's a beautiful um, area here called Salto de Roldan, uh, which is a beautiful place with conglomerates uh, that were deposited uh, exactly really at the front. Um, and they, were, they are very spectacular. Uh, maybe we can go there in, in the spring. That's an aerial view of the Pico del Aguila anticline now. Um, so, uh, and I, I just realized it's uh, 16, 12 past 16. If you want, we, we do uh, maybe a 10 minutes break. I will stop uh, recording. Uh, would be good to make a 10 minute break. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will. All right, so we start. Again, my share screen. Okay, so this is an aerial view of uh, the anticline. So you see, it's very similar to the geological map. Um, or maybe you, you don't see that, but this, this dark part of the picture, you know, you can follow like this, the, the boundary between the dark and the light uh, gray is like this. It goes up here and then down and then go down here again. So this is all the carbonates and this is all the pre-growth strata. And then here in the this kind of gray here and this gray here, you have the, the growth strata per se. And you can see, for instance, I know it's maybe not so easy, but Mm, I think you can see the, the strata here. You see, I, I, I go on along some lines. There is clearly some, uh, some uh, roads uh, like this. This one as well is a road. This big trace here that goes here and then right up here, this is a gazoduc. Okay. The picture is old and it's taken not, not long after it was made. 
But you see strata. This is a strata. All of these are strata. And here in the basin, we see some. And so they are you know, parallel to the base of the syncline here. And then they go like this. And here, you see, they onlap onto the fold. So for instance, if you follow this one, there is no thickness between it and between the fold here, whereas there's a lot of thickness between here and the pre-growth strata here. So this is clearly a growth strata. Same thing for, for this side. You see this, the, the strata here going here, and then I follow them with the mouse, I go here. They just onlap, offlap onto the fold here. So they are in contact almost with the carbonates. And here, this strata has a lot of thickness. There is a lot of sediment thickness between here and the carbonate. And it's actually, if you follow it, there is a massive thickness here. So all of this thickness does not exist here, which means it was deposited here and not here. Therefore, the, go, the, the, the fold was active during deposition of this interval. OK? Yes. Yes. So a bit more mapping uh, shows that basically this is a pre-growth and this is the end of the scene growth. Everything above is, um, is post-growth. And this is uh, Cretaceous and in the center there is actually the, the deformation in the center is quite intense. I don't know if you see it here, but as you remember with the napkin, what I was doing at some point, the fold get, gets locked. And so, and the deformation inside, um, you know, if I, if I uh, take again uh, this, you can imagine, you know, this is easy with a napkin, but imagine you have rocks inside. First, when you do that, you see there is air coming up below my napkin. In the case of salt, there is salt being sucked up here, okay, which comes and fill the, the dark here. And, and of course, you can imagine how intense is the deformation here when, when you come to that, okay, when it's rocks. With a napkin, it's easy, but when it's rocks, it's, uh, it's different. So this is what we see here inside the, the fold. And this is the scene tectonic, and this is the post tectonic. And as part of my master and uh, also a little bit during my PhD, I uh, looked at the, um, uh, I mapped this area. And in particular, I looked at the, 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 the strata and their relationship with the structure. And I also interpreted the vertical successions uh, in the syncline of uh, Argis, in the syncline of Belsue, and on top of the anticline, I interpreted them in terms of sequences. And I could identify flooding surfaces. You remember flooding surface is the time, the turnover time between progradation and retrogradation. And it's not like a maximum flooding surface, which is the turnover between retrogradation and progradation, okay? So flooding surface is actually the, sh the shallowest depositional environment on the succession, whereas maximum flooding surface is the deepest depositional environment on a vertical su succession. So I could map those, those flooding surfaces. And also I could map uh, by walking, simply walking laterally on the, on the surfaces. Uh, I could map their, their relationship with each other and with the fold. And here what we clearly see is that from the base of the syntectonic series to FS2, you know, here you have a lot of thickness and here it's zero. Okay. So there is a moment in the, at the beginning of the uh, fold history where the growth of the fold is so fast that you don't deposit anything on its top. Maybe it's actually even out of the water. Whereas here it's below water and there is uh, sediment being deposited. Same thing here, okay, between the base and FS2. 
uh, dashed lines because it's not easy to follow here. It seems that there is zero thickness here and a lot of thickness here. So this is the moment where the fold starts growing and, uh, and uh, it's so, the growth is so fast that the, the, the top of the fold is actually outside of the water or just at the water level with in high energy environments. And both sink lines are deeper and they, uh, they accumulate sediment. After FS2, you see that when, for instance, if I take um, uh, between FS2 and FS4, I have sediment here, but FS4 continues above. So I also have sediment here. So the, the difference in thickness, here maybe you have uh, 200, 300 meters. This is horizontal distance, huh? but 200 meters. And here maybe you have 100 meters. So the amount of growth, of relative growth between syncline and anticline is, is less than before, which means that now the top of the anticline is buried under sediment. If we would be uh, you know, diving at the time of FS4, we will see a, a very little depression here in Belsway and a little uh, positive relief on the anticline or, or nothing, actually. It's so little growth, so little difference over the time we're speaking about that maybe we, won't, we wouldn't even see the topographic expression of this uh, tectonic structure. Okay. Um, so these are the sections I, uh, I uh, logged. Uh, one, section one, for instance, is I think one kilometer. Uh, or 1.2 kilometer thick. This is a view, a beautiful view of this side. So we are, we are sitting somewhere here on top of the anticline, or maybe here actually, and taking a picture towards the west. We see the, the lake and the little village of Argis, and we see the base of the syncline here and all the succession, including the very uh, prominent uh, deltaic deposits that are deposited here. So we see the lake, we see the base of the syncline, we see the next fold also there, and we see all the succession uh, and the village of Argis and the deltaic sediments here on top of the succession. Um, in terms of age, um, the pre-tectonic lutation and all the Pamplona and Argis Marls are these successions here, very, very marly, you know, you see, very uh, not expressed in the landscape. And here, when you see the topography starts to climb up like this, it's also because the rocks become more resistant, okay? And that's because there is more and more sand. And that's because you go into the, uh, uh, Belsway Atares formation, which is a delta formation. And here above, when it's green, it's a different type of vegetation, and that marks the fluvial succession. So that's what you see. First, the Pamplona and Argis Mars, then the Belsway Atares formation and sandstones, and then the uh, Campo d'Arbe conglomerate. This is all a fluvial succession, which is pre abonian Oligocene in age. Um, okay, that's a view from the sink line. Uh, this is a view from here somewhere. We, sh we just stand somewhere here and we look here. So you now see the Argis anticline and you see the succession in front. So you see the Argis Mars and Pamplona Mars. You see the deltaic coming here. And then above the big deltaic bar here, you see all the fluvial uh, conglomerates above. So here is an example of onlap of flooding surface one onto the eastern limb. If you come back to my mapping here, if this is correct, uh, the FS1, flooding surface one is here and you see it pinches out here. Um, that's this FS1 is here and then it goes here and then it pinches out here into uh, the fold. 
So this is what you see, oops, sorry, no, it's the FS1 is actually this surface here and it goes here and here. Okay, so what you see on the field, you see a succession with Marley, blue Mars, facious, and here you see something more resistant. Okay, so these blue Mars facious, they are pro delta uh, slope deposits. So this is a um, open marine. Uh, these are the, um, the um, bottom sets, if you want, of a delta X system coming from the east. And then you see more sandy facies here. These sandy facies here, they are the uh, mouth bars and more deltaic facies. Uh, and so you can follow. So this is a. So basically, this is a progradational succession, reaching the the shallowest facies here, and then it's sharply over overlain by something with with no resistance here. Okay, it makes even a hole behind which means it's sharply overlain by uh, deeper facies. So this is a flooding surface because on top of it, here on top, you flood again. You, you gain, you increase water depth again. So that's a flooding surface. And so this flooding surface, we can follow here and then here and then here and then here. And this is the carbonates of the pre-growth strata. These are the lutetian Guara uh, limestone. Guara is the formation name. So if you get here, you have lutetian carbonates. And if you get here, you have these deltaic, uh, shallow deltaic facies. And so both of them, they, I mean, the, 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 the deltaic facies, they onlap onto the carbonates. Whereas here, there is a lot of uh, open marine sediments. So this onlap means that at the time when this this layer was deposited horizontal, this layer was already deformed and tilted. So the fold was already active. This is a view of the Eastern syncline. What I just spoke about is somewhere here. We don't see it very well. It's on, the, on this flank. But the FS1 is one of those two. It's probably this layer here. So you see, we see very well sequences. You see it's no expression, no resistance, fields, that's uh, open marine deltaic uh, facies with uh, a lot of marls and clays and shales. And then topography rises up to a deltaic, shallow marine deltaic, flooding surface. Again, a field, maximum flooding surface, maximum shale, and then again, a flooding surface. And then again, a field and the road. No wonder the road goes here. It's the, it's the easiest place to build a road because it's all shaly and not resistant. And then again, it rises again, topography. It's getting sandier and sandier and sandier up to here. And then here, big jump in the topography towards something more shaly. So again, it rises to a new flooding surface and then down into a maximum flooding surface. And then it rises again, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a, a series of sequences and those sequences are those that we, uh, that we that I mapped. And this is the pre-growth carbonate uh, um, deep, deep, deep surface. Uh, so it's the structural surface of the top of the carbonate of the Guara limestone. And then they turn here and they go doing this next fold to the east. You see the, also the syntectonic sediment turning here and going there. And then they turn again to do this double fold that I was showing in the in the cross section before, and the Sierra de Guara in the in the distance. So here, what I want to show uh, is wait a second. I need to go a little bit further. Um, yes. You know, I want to say something that is not written here in the in the PowerPoint. Uh, is that one important thing, and I'm not going to elaborate too much on this because it's not it's not uh, ready uh, in this PowerPoint. But before going further in what I'm going to go uh, to, to what I'm going to to tell you. Um, one very important 
thing that we look at is, uh, you know, the fact that there is a lot of sediment here and zero here means that the rate of relief, local relief creation by the fold is higher than the rate of sedimentation. Okay, so there is a, a, a ratio between uplift and sedimentation. And the ratio between uplift and sedimentation governs whether you have on-lap, off-lap, or really overlap. Okay, so it governs whether your strata, they on-lap onto the fold, whether they just go right above with zero, or whether they completely go above because the fold is actually buried. So if the rate of tectonic um, growth of tectonic development of the anticline is less than the rate at which it is buried under sediment, then you have offlap and the strata go over it. If however, the, the fold grows really faster then it can be buried with sediment, then the strata go and unlap onto it. Okay. So. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Hmm. This is Siri. Oh, I thought my, I thought one of you is talking to my watch. Um, so this is very important because uh, that gives us already a view that the fold was, if, if sedimentation rate is constant, then the way it looks here is that the fold was very fastly growing at the beginning and then less and less fastly growing, uh, less and less quickly growing towards the end. And at the end it stopped growing because everything goes above it without thickening in the syncline and thinning on top of the anticline. Okay, but remember is the ratio between tectonic and sedimentation. Therefore, also if sedimentation changes, therefore we also have changes in the relationships. Okay, maybe it's tectonic, which is constant and sedimentation, which is changing. Okay, yet what I showed you before is that the fold with the napkin is that the fold grows fast at the beginning and slower at the end until it reaches uh, really zero. Now I get uh, to uh, this idea that we can see there are sequences. We can, uh, I'm going to show you the, the, the sedimentary facies here, but one of the main ID here was also to, to test on the field whether if the local tectonics could modify, distort, change, um, destruct the sequence stratigraphic framework, the sequence stratigraphic uh, structure of uh, these uh, syntectonic sedimentary record. Okay. The fact that my delta progrades until here and then retrogrades, this is happening in the sink line. Okay. As I get towards the fast growing anticline here, is this going to be affected? You know, and this is a period where the anticline is growing fast. Um, then later here, the sediment are on the top. Are, do I find the same sequences in the syncline and on the top of the anticline? Or does the anticline growth disturb my progradation, retrogradation of the delta, you know? You can imagine if you're, if you're there on top of the anticline, let's say the anticline is growing much faster than sea level is rising, maybe that will have an impact on the sediment. So this was, this is why I studied a little bit more in detail the facies. And so I could identify uh, different uh, facies and, and, and associations of uh, facies. But all of it is basically deltaic and it goes from distal to proximal. These are like cross-sectional views of the flood dominated delta, a carbonate ramp and a storm uh, zonation. 
and I identified six facious associations, and they all look, they all, um, you know, give me paleo uh, bathymetries, paleo water depth, such that you can actually uh, look at uh, the water depth evolution, determine the sequences, and then work out also tectonics. I will explain. Um, but you go from sandy facies with uh, a lot of um, bed forms showing high energy environments, uh, even uh, with storms and um, uh, uh, hummocky cross stratifications going from shore face, uh, proximal upper offshore to distal upper offshore. And then you go down into shalier and shalier facies, even below the storm wave base. And these are different examples of pictures, um, but we don't really have time to go through that. Let me check. Mm. These are very bioturbated, bioclastic facies associations. Okay, so that's in the upper offshore because we are still between the, the fair weather wave base and the storm wave base. And that's what we call distal to median uh, ramp. Um, very nodular uh, limestone and also very dirty limestones in the sense that there is a lot of clay and shale and actually silt and sand into them. Uh, this is a bit more massive, but still bioclastic facies association, more proximal, you know, more massive, but still very bioturbated and nodular. Now into the clastic facies, uh, something really clear is the influence of tides. So here you have a close up view of uh, sandstone quite coarse, uh, even sometimes with little uh, granules and gravels, and of course, sigmoidal uh, bed forms with clay, uh, clay drapes in between and kind of thinning, thickening um, um, tidal bundles. And so the influence of tide is really strong. And this is up offshore to lower shore face, meaning really shallow uh, in the front delta, uh, probably subtidal dunes. This is a very nice uh, facious association that we mm, interpret to be in the delta front. So we have cross stratified sandstones, uh, often reworked with homochi cross stratifications in the top of the of the of the sandstone beds. You see thin to medium bedded and then thick bedded here. There is even erosional structures. You see the thick bed here and much thinner here. Um, and this is all um, also relatively uh, not, not so well sorted sandstone with still a lot of uh, clay into them showing kind of um, massive um, uh, suspension uh, uh, fallout. So you, you um, how do we call this? Um, uh, sedimentation is, is pretty abrupt. So we are probably close to mouth bars, uh, you know, as a river enters uh, the marine uh, domain, then the, the flow that was transporting the sand in the channels, uh, when they get into the open uh, waters, they, the, the flow deconfine and loses energy and all the sediment is then settles down uh, out of suspension. Um, so with these facious associations, I could I could do, do a, a section, a pseudo uh, cross section with all the facies showing how the facies change, with paleo flow directions also shown here in a rose diagram, um, and often you see there is a lot of directions showing a lot of the tidal uh, influence, and I could build uh, a sequence stratigraphic framework. So of course, in the first, in the beginning of the syntectonic sediments, you know, first cycle, re progradation, retrogradation cycle. In the first cycle, there is onlap onto the anticline, and I can find the sequence on both sides. So I cannot see how it's changed here because it doesn't exist even here. But what I can say uh, is that. Yeah, the influence of the local structure here is simply to uh, prevent deposition on top of it. So the, the growth rate of the anticline is faster than sedimentation rate. And therefore you, you have onlap on both flanks of the anticline. During the sequence two and uh, three and during the rest, 
Now sedimentation rate catches up with uplift rate of the anticline. So it means if sedimentation rate is more or less constant, it means that the anticline growth starts to slow down. How does that affect my sequence stratigraphy? It's not very clear, but uh, what I can say tentatively, and if my mapping was correct, is that the flooding surface of cycle two, I can observe it here, observe it here, and then follow it and map it, uh, walk on it. But you see, I put dashed lines. Uh, it's expressed here as well, but here it's not expressed. It's not, it's not the shallowest facies here. The shallowest facies of the sequence two seems to come, seems to occur later, up, upper in the section. So there is a possibility here, if the mapping is correct, if my interpretation of the facies is correct, there is a possibility here that by growing at the same time as sedimentation was taking place, locally, the uh, growth of the anticline forced progradation to take place during a longer period of time when retrogradation was already taken place, taking place in both synclines. Okay, so progradation was still happening here while we were already in a state of retrogradation, deepening upward in the synclines. You can imagine, uh, let's say base level is rising. It's rising at the same rate everywhere on this section. But imagine that you superimpose syncline subsidence and base level in the here. If you superimpose syncline subsidence and base level rise, you tend to enhance or uh, provide a context that is uh, in favor of retrogradation, deepening upward. However, on the top of the anticline, because you have you still have base level rise as everywhere, but since your tectonic creates topographic growth and uplift, local uplift, it's possible that if uplift is faster than base level rise, you actually um, decrease accommodation creation here on top of the anticline. And therefore you force progradation on top of the anticline while you still have retrogradation here in the syncline. Then, so, so this will be an example. This will be one example of a local distortion, a local uh, modification of stratigraphic cycles. For the other sequences, I didn't, I cannot say I found the same. To be honest, sequence three is so small that if there was a difference in timing, it would be impossible to see. And I couldn't, I cannot say that I saw something similar for sequence four and also not for sequence five. So it doesn't seem to me that uh, those other sequences were affected in such a way as sequence two. Um, so to conclude on this, I would say that the growth of, of, a, of a local structure can locally disturb, locally uh, destroy uh, your sequence stratigraphic uh, architecture, but uh, in a limited way, okay? In a, in a not, I mean, in an important way when it, for, for example, for sequence one, when it prevents deposition on top, but in an overall limited way, because I can still find my sequences here on top of the anticline. Okay. Uh, and also one of the question was, do these such anticlines, synclines, uh, does such local tectonics um, create local sequences? Okay, 
And here I, I, I cannot say that the anticline created any local sequence. You know, these sequences I can find all across the area and also beyond the area to the east and to the west. So, um, so the anticline itself does not create new sequences. It may just destroy the possibility for sequences to be deposited and it may modify the timing of key stratigraphic surfaces, but that's it. All right. Um, I just would like to uh, continue a little bit on this by showing how the growth strata can be used to distinguish between different models of uh, different modes of uh, growth of those folds. And this is a paper by uh, Joseph Poblet and Stuart Hardy, 1995. Um, it's just to say there are two end member models for fold growing. One is by limb lengthening and one is by limb rotation. The limb is the flank of the anticline. Okay, it's the side of the anticline. So here you, maybe you don't see what this is, but this is just pre-growth uh, and uh, so if I uh, stop share and show my little uh, napkin again, you know, if you put your hand like this and you fold, you know, you see both limbs now, they cannot grow in length. Their length, the, the, the length of the flanks here is, is fixed. They only rotate. They, are, they have little, uh, a small dip towards the right and towards the left at the beginning. And then the dip increases, but they just rotate. Another way is to grow by, uh, so you start with a small fold like this, and then you lengthen the, the flanks as you grow. Okay, so th this is a, a different context. Huh? This is the limb or the flank. So limb can just rotate if the hinges, the charnières are fixed, or limbs can actually grow in length uh, as the anticline grows. Sometimes, theoretically, the limb could actually grow without much rotation. And of course, you can have a combination. You know, you can grow and grow the length and grow the limbs and rotate at the same time. All right, I will share again. So these are the two models and they, they uh, in a way they result in different um, attitudes of the growth strata with respect to the the shape of the this trajectory of the limb of the of the hinge, the hinge is this place, this localized place where the the dip uh, changes. Okay, so you see here trajectories of the of the of the hinges uh, in the limb rotation and in the limb lengthening, and you see different attitudes of the strata. And they used the Pico del Aguila anticline, the the, the Argis anticline that I've just shown you, to try to reconstruct this. Um, and I'm sorry, but I, I don't absolutely remember uh, what was their conclusion, but I think they concluded that uh, clearly there was a, it's hard to actually distinguish, especially if there is a combination of, of both, but, but I still find pragmatically it's, it's useful to know about this. Here I just did a small uh, simulation, you know, of a detachment anticline by hinge migration. You see, I, I have the hinge 
the hinge migration is limb lengthening. You know, the flanks here, their side, their, their length increases with time. So this is at the beginning and this is at the end. And here is by limb rotation. You see the fold is like this at the beginning and then at the end, the top is here and the, the limb is here. So there is rotation of the, of the limb and motion like this. What I think is interesting is that in a pure hinge migration limb lengthening model, um, the, the uplift, so the elevation of the top of the fold, which is here at the beginning and here at the end, evolves with compression over time in a linear fashion. Okay, the way the, the top of the anticline increases its elevation with ongoing slip, ongoing compression is linear with time. Whereas in the case of limb rotation, okay, with fixed hinges, the crestal uplift, the, the uplift of the, of the crest of the top of the anticline is fast at the beginning and slower and slower at the end. Okay, and when the when you know the limb becomes vertical, if you continue from there, when the limb becomes vertical, then you cannot anymore continue uplift. So, uh, do you agree? I continue until five ten. Yes, no problem for me. The others. Yes. Okay. No okay. Problem. Okay, I just just to maybe I will be finished before, but just to finish that part, and then I will I will record the 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 fault in the faults. Um, so what I thought would be interesting is to to try to do a, a reconstruction of the way the top of the anticline has evolved uh, with time, and so to do this, you could say, okay, I'm just going to take. Uh, you know, the difference in thickness between this and this here. And the difference in thickness will tell me how, how high was my anticline during sedimentation. Remember this super simple drawing here. Sorry, I come back to the beginning. When I do this, if this is flat here, if I want to know how high is my fold, I just can take the thickness here minus the thickness here, and I have the height of the fold. I continue, I take the thickness here and the thickness here, the difference gives me the incremental growth of the fold, okay? And so by doing this strata by strata, I could reconstruct the growth of the fold with time. But, now I go here into uh, where I was, but sedimentation happens below sea level. And so, you know, in this configuration at time one, let's say my fold starts to grow. This is my pre-tectonic strata in gray and they, my fold starts to grow. So the, the top of the anticline goes a little bit high. I do H, okay? The water depth now is B prime one, and here in the syncline it's B one. If I fill this up completely, then the difference in thickness will tell me H, okay? But if I don't fill it up completely, let's say I put that much into the syncline and that much onto the anticline, because I have a bit more energy here and a bit less energy here, so I can deposit more here and less on top. Then the difference in thickness gives me something which is smaller than the real height difference. I need to also take into account the difference in bathymetry. Okay, and so I need to sum up S2 and B2, sum up S2 prime and B2 prime, and make the difference of these two to find H2, okay? So I need to know the paleobathymetry at the time of deposition of that layer. 
okay? I would also need to decompact. And so we did that. I was working at the time with Cécile Robin, Delphine Ruby, François Guillaucho, uh, Isabelle Coutin, uh, Thierry Nalpas, people in, uh, people in Rennes, uh, where I was doing my master. And we did that. Um, it is, I mean, there are a lot of uncertainties because when you reconstruct paleobatimetries, there is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but we did that for several intervals and try to test what we could find. And this is the result. Um, and so basically this shows you the uplift of the Argis anticline as time goes by, okay? With all the sequences here. And what we see is that at the beginning there is fast uplift, but then a period of slow uplift. Uh, and then a period of very fast uplift here Okay, and then it's quite linear, actually. Um, and this is an uncertainty on the estimation of paleo, uh, due mainly to the estimation of paleobatimetry and compaction. So, um, what to take from this curve? Uh, it's difficult, but I, I would say this doesn't allow to really make a difference to really distinguish between this and this. If anything, it looks actually rather like this, especially at the end. But at the beginning, it looks a bit more like this. So, well, especially here, here and here. So it's a bit more complex than we thought. And maybe some of this complexity arises simply because uh, sedimentation rate is also not constant. Okay, there is also climate, sea level, doing these cycles, and so it's it's not so easy uh, to come to to uh, to a proper record. And also, the uplift rate of the anticline is also probably not totally constant. I quite like to give an order of magnitude of of the kind of uplift rate we have in total here. It's 0.2 millimeter per year, as you remember. Millimeter per year is the equivalent to meter per thousand years and it's the equivalent to kilometers per million years. So this is 0.2 kilometers per million years. It's 200 meters per million years. So it's not, it's not fast. Uh, yet, when you look at the landscape, it's pretty impressive, I find, when you, see, when you see this, when you see such a thickening and a thinning onto the anticline, or when you see that. So think about it, 0.2 millimeter per year. It's every year uh, the fifth of a grain of sand, which is one millimeter thick. So on average, the, the local relief that this anticline was creating every year, if you would have a boat and you could look below the sea at that time, what you would see is a difference of height of the top of the anticline with respect to the sink line of the fifth of one millimeter. Okay, so it's very little. Basically, you wouldn't see that, of course. Yet, multiply this by millions of years, actually five, and then you get a dramatic difference in thickness of about one kilometer in the sink line and 200 meters on top of the anticline, or 300 meters. Okay, so in such a shallow marine uh, mixed delta E carbonate, mostly flood uh, dominated. So, sorry, um, conclusions on, on this study, not so relevant to, to the topic here, but uh, this was the identification of the depositional environments. Um, also, we identified sequences. And what's more relevant is that there is a modification of the cycles according to uplift rate, step one, two, and three. Not so sure for three, very destructive for one with no expression of one on top, and a modification of the flooding, the, the time of occurrence of flooding surface of cycle two. Timing of key stratigraphic surfaces, and overall, a very slow continuous growth of 0.2 millimeter per year. Compare this to Taiwan, for instance, which is, that's what I uh, didn't say, which is sometimes 20 millimeter per year, two centimeter per year, 
which will give 20 kilometers per million year. So much faster uh, rate of, uh, of uplift of some structures, you know. Mostly Taiwan is more like five millimeter per year. Um, okay, I have more to say, but I will uh, try to get back to this uh, onto a video that I will uh, post uh, next time so that you can uh, look at it. Um, and uh, voila, that's it, for, that's it for today. I will just stop recording. Thank you. Stop recording.